So before I start, may I ask all you to stand and bit stretch up because we have a very good session. So I'll, I'll stand up, have a stretch up, and get fresh for the next session. So we have our colleagues from Aachen Hospital, from Department of Anesthesia, who have came all the way from Karachi to conduct a very interactive session on the vascular anesthesia and critical care. So may I ask Dr. Sami, Do uh, Sami Askar Dogar to kindly come and take over as a moderator role. Yeah. The chair for this session are Dr. Ziad Sufi and uh, Professor Iqbal and Dr. Umar Esan. Can you kindly take the ch uh, chair seat, please? So I am I'm going to begin this session by asking a question that how many of you have ever encountered a situation when you have planned for a surgery and a junior member of your team calls to inform that anesthesia has asked for a cardiology consult? So uh, my conflict of interest for this session is that I am that anesthesiologist. <laughs> All right. So uh, we will begin with this scenario. Mr. Fazal is a 75-year-old male, presents for pre-op evaluation. Excuse me. So Mr. Fazal is a 75-year-old male, presents for pre-op evaluation prior to fistula surgery for renal failure. He has medical history significant for type 2 diabetes mellitus, hypertension, recent diagnosis of renal failure. He has been undergoing hemodialysis for the past month. There is no prior history of ischemic heart disease. An ECG was advised as part of the preoperative investigation. So this is the ECG. What do you think this ECG shows? Fit for surgery. Yes, something wrong. All right. So uh, there is a left bundle branch plot. There are Q waves in lead 3 and lead AVF. Uh, no, probably I think it's an excess deviation. That is why Qs are going down. So what to do now? Now we see here that there is no prior history of ischemic heart disease, but there are some risk factors. The patient is 75 year old. He has diabetes, hypertensive, a recent onset of renal failure. So how to approach these incidental ECG findings? I am going to talk about it in light of these uh, 2014 American Heart Association guidelines for perioperative cardiovascular evaluation and management of patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery. So uh, this guidelines were developed with all the societies, uh, medicine, anesthesia, surgery, vascular medicine. And the second guidelines were the more recent 2022 European Society of Cardiology guidelines for cardiovascular assessment before non-cardiac surgery. So before uh, going into these, I just want to briefly tell that we are concerned about three things. We are concerned about the functional class of the patient. Uh, we are concerned about the risk category of the surgery and about the urgency of the need of the surgery. So, it was planned under general anesthesia, a fistula surgery. So these were uh, AHA guidelines. Uh, I'm sure you can't see it, but to simplify it, step number one, the AHA guidelines ask that what is the urgency of surgery? So in case of emergency, proceed for surgery without any further testing. Step number two, is there acute coronary syndrome? So acute coronary syndrome is n STEMI, ST segment changes, or unstable angina. So if there is acute coronary syndrome and it is not an emergency, then it should be treated before the surgery. And then estimate the surgical risk. If it is a low risk surgery, then you can simply proceed without any further testing. So first you see if the nature of the surgery, if it is emergency, you have to proceed for surgery. If there is acute coronary syndrome, you have to treat it. And if it is a low risk surgery, then you can also proceed without any further testing. So how to determine the risk uh, of surgery? There are different scores. The oldest one is the revised cardiac risk index, which simply relies on six parameters. And the latest one, sorry, the most validated one uh, is the Nesquip score. It has been validated in 1.4 million patients. So different trials about 1.4 million patients. So 
all these calculators are available online. If you just Google it, they are on MD, Calc, and based using those calculators, you can categorize if the patient has low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk surgery. So, now what happens if the surgery is not a low risk surgery? Most vascular surgeries are not low risk surgeries. So, it is a case of elevated risk. So now you will come on the functional class of the patient and you will see what is the functional class of the patient. So if the functional class of the patient is very good, more than 10 mets, no further testing is required and you can proceed for surgery. And if the functional class is moderate, between 4 to 10 mets, still the recommendation is to proceed without further uh, investigations, but the strength of recommendation decreases from 2A to 2B. And the challenging part is when the functional class is unknown or functional class is poor. Then you have to see that will further testing impact decision making? Is there an alternate to the surgical tre treatment that can be offered? And if there is an alternate, then go for pharmacological stress testing. And if there is no alternate and the surgery has to be done, then there is no point of doing any further testing. So the European uh, guidelines are also very similar and they specifically talk about when to do a transthoracic echocardiogram whenever there is a newly detected murmur and symptoms and signs of cerebrovascular disease. TE is recommended before non-cardiac surgery. It also recommends that if the newly detected murmur suggests a significant pathology uh, then for all in all high risk surgeries you have to do you should do a transthoracic echocardiogram and in patients in which there is a murmur but without any sign and symptoms of cerebrovascular disease TE should be considered and the strength of recommendation is 2A. What happens if a patient has chest pain before surgery? For elective surgeries just like the AHA guidelines complete diagnostic workup before surgery and for urgent surgeries they say a multidisciplinary assessment approach is recommended to choose the treatment with lowest total risk of the patient. So which surgeries are high risk? So on the left are the low risk surgeries. Uh, uh, under, unfortunately, there is no vascular surgery. Nahi hai. So most vascular surgery comes between the intermediate risk and high risk categories. So we also see that our patient is 75 year old. So how does age contribute to surgical risk? So in this uh, European Society of Cardiology guidelines, they have also focused about the frailty assessment that for patients who are more than 70 years of age being scheduled to under, undergo intermediate and high risk non-cardiac surgery, screening should be considered using a validated screening tool. So one of the common tool is the frailty index is the most commonly recommended tool, but it includes cognitive testing and that is a bit difficult. So a simple uh, tool like clinical frailty scale, which only relies on information from the history can be used. And these tools are also available online. And this clinical frailty scale has been validated against the frailty index. So these European Society of Cardiology guidelines, they talk about stress imaging, when to do stress imaging. Stress imaging should be considered before high risk non-cardiac surgery in asymptomatic patients with poor functional capacity or who have a previous history of angioplasty or cabbage. So can we reduce this risk preoperatively? So they suggest that you have to, you can modify the risk factors. Smoking cessation for more than four weeks before non-cardiac surgery is recommended and control of other risk factors like blood pressure, dyslipidemia, diabetes, and pharmacological treatment of patients who are on diuretic, they recommend discontinuation of diuretic on the day of surgery. So we talked about stress testing. So which stress test? We have uh, stress ECG, stress eco, and MPS. So stress ECG is poor value in patients who already have a pre-existing ST segment change, who have a bundle branch blot like our patient, and point, who have more than 0.1 uh, millivolt ST segment depression on resting ECG. 
So stress ECG should only be considered if non-invasive imaging tests are unavailable, all for assessing functional capacity when clinical history is ambiguous. Stress echo. Stress echo is not recommended with an unstable clinical condition like uh, acute coronary syndrome. And normal stress echo has a high negative predictive value. The strongest predictor for post-operative adverse events are a significant ischemia of more than four ventricular segments. Ischemia threshold 60% of age predicted maximum heart rate and history of congestive heart failure. And the other advantage of doing a stress echo is that in addition of uh, risk stratification, it also tells us about the dynamic evaluation of the ventricles, the diastolic function, the valvular function, and pulmonary hypertension. So the next is myocardial perfusion imaging. It is suitable if patients have poor acoustic windows for DSC. And meta-analysis have demonstrated that compared with Fitch defects, reversible perfusion defects were associated with higher risk of cardiac death or non-fatal MI. And the risk of cardiac event correlates with the extent of reversible perfusion. So more the reversible perfusion defect, more is the risk. Severe in terms of uh, severe in terms of 20%, it involves 20% of the myocardium. So uh, both these guidelines talked about the functional class, how to assess the old or the uh, commonly used technique was by METS. Less than four METS is considered poor functional class, four to six METS is moderate functional class, and more than 10 METS is good functional class. But unfortunately, most of these tools are not validated on our population. A simpler method is to check for the ability to climb two flight of stairs. Is it reliable? Yes, there are two studies. Uh, one was done in uh, 2005 in which a large prospective cohort study of high-risk patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery found self-reported inability to climb two flight of stairs added incremental value to the 30-day cardiac event rate. And this was also supported by another study done in 2020 that self-reported uh, functional class, the ability to climb two flight of stairs is a significant uh, value that you can rely on in determining functional class. And there is also a new scale which is Duke Activity st uh, Status Index. It is also available online. Uh, this is also a sort of self-reported scale in which you add all the values. Can you take care of yourself? Can you walk indoors? Uh, can you walk on level? And if the score is less than 34, there is an increased risk of 30-day death or MI after surgery. So based on all these guidelines, now we have these four scenarios. And I will uh, ask you, what is your opinion? What should we do? So the, in the first scenario, we have good functional class. It's a low-risk surgery and it is an emergency surgery. Proceed. Okay. So even if you find uh, new findings in ECG, you have to proceed. The second scenario is poor functional class, high risk elective surgery. Work up. Work up. Okay. Third is poor functional class, low risk elective surgery. So the guidelines say that in low risk elective surgeries, you can proceed without any work up if the course of management is not expected to change with testing. So uh, if a surgery can be deferred indefinitely for a long period of time, then you only do a, a preoperative further cardiac workup. So in the last scenario is poor functional class, intermediate risk elective surgery. So yes, so this is that group in which workup should be done. So if the functional class is poor and if the uh, it's an elective surgery, then the discriminating thing would be that whether it's a low risk surgery or an intermediate risk surgery. So coming back to our scenario, so what should be done in this case? And what is the information which is missing, which we should know to come to this? Yes, functional class. So we should inquire about the functional class of this patient, which will determine whether to proceed or, or to do further testing. So in summary, while deciding pre-op cardiology workup, three things are important, nature of urgency, patient's functional class, and risk of surgery. 
and no tardic workup is required in emergency cases when the patient has good functional class and the surgery is low risk. Thank you very much. Any questions from? No. It is common practice that we have an emergency surgery and we, when the anesthesia assessment is done, they ask the cardiologist to come. And the cardiologist come and they advise an MPS scan and the MPS scan is done. So, uh, is there, uh, for example, does can the anesthesia or surgeon can take a decision to proceed with surgery without these uh, cardiology review or like that? And why it is required for anesthesia to have this cardiology review? All right. So uh, uh, one of so this happens routinely. So one way to deal it with this situation is to involve the family in decision making. And uh, if the family is involved and it is given the option, do you want to have more information about what sort of risk you are going to undergo having this surgery? So with this sort of approach, I. I have personally encountered three group of people. One group of people who say, we don't want any further tests, please don't delay the surgery, we want to proceed. The second group says that we want you to do every test which is possible, we want to know how much is the risk. So these two people are straightforward. But the third group who leave the decision on you, that is the challenging uh, task in which you have to keep all these things in, under consideration. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Iris, my school surgeon. Uh, my question is the same as that of uh, Zia. <coughs> that we see that many a times the ICU is run by the anesthetist. So if you can make decision in the ICU about so critical patients, do you really need a review of cardiologist for a patient who is actually going into your dom domain? Yes, I totally agree with you that cardiology consult shouldn't be done unnecessarily and so for all the cases in which there is good functional class there is so we also need to understand that why this cardiology consult is needed so this cardiology consult is needed only for one purpose so that you don't miss a patient who has an inducible ischemia who might not tolerate the stress of the surgery and may have an adverse cardiac event within 30 days of surgery. So we just want to identify this specific group of patients. But if the functional class is good, that means that the patient has good effort tolerance. If the surgery is low risk, then there is not much of a stress on the patient. Then you don't need these things. What is the legal aspect? I mean, at times, do you need it for uh, just to make yourself safe about it? Sir, I'm not really sure uh, because legal things in Pakistan are already, uh, we already know how they're working. Yes. Right, we'll take one last question. Uh, actually, it's yeah. not it's, it's not a question, you know, I myself is cardiac and it's yeah. sitting comment, over here. Comment, please. And, yeah. and I'm Dr. Fakhar. So, so, you know, uh, it's a very valid question, you know, when we can manage a patient in the post-operative period, why we ask a cardiology consult. Actually, it's for the risk stratification one, which he has already explained, and, and we want the family on board. We know the treatment, you know, we, we do ask for the cardiology consult just for the risk stratification and, and for the, you know, a uh, few investigations which the cardiologist is only performing. The thing is that the cardiologists, they are not inside theater while we are managing such type of patients. How many cardiologists are there you know, in your setup who are assisting the anesthetist during the operation? We know the management, we do the management on ourselves and, and it's only a risk stratification you know, thing. And as far as the legal thing is concerned, probably in Pakistan, it's, it's too early to say about these things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Can I add uh, comments? Uh, I, think, I think that's that's <laughs> what it is. It's to basically label the patient as high risk by a cardiologist and then move on, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, uh, the one comment is like, uh, if uh, we need a cardiologist for the risk stratification uh, to get the family on board and we know that, and we know the management, 
but like just like uh, you are all vascular surgeons you are doing the radiology and everything but you sometimes need an official reporting from the radiologist to see that to tell the family that this is this is the problem we are anticipating this problem and the radiologist also documented that so that is the part where the cardiologists need to be on board for that they are, we, if uh, i from these guidelines we all know that what are high risk low risk intermediate risk but the family wants to hear from a cardiologist that what they are saying what they are uh, like suspecting like it should be a high risk or a low risk so i think so that that is the reason where we need to put a cardiologist on board as well so that that is the main purpose uh, thank you very much guidelines. thank you very much let's move to our uh, next uh, presentation Okay, so I would like to invite Dr. Soheb. Uh, he's going to talk about clinical scenarios about massive blood transfusion. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> so, uh, the, my name is Soheb. I'm working as an assistant professor in the Department of Anesthesia at Khan Hospital. Uh, so, I will be just uh, in next 10 to 15 minutes. We'll be going through quickly about the uh, like the massive blood transfusion scenario we usually. Uh, encounter in our uh, operation theater and what we can do differently or a little bit uh, uh, like a new updates on that. Uh, so from the first slide, no disclosure of uh, interest and the objectives of my presentation will be like a uh, massive blood transfusion definition, what is damage control resuscitation, point of care resuscitation, and what are the complications associated with this uh, massive transfusion. Uh, so to begin with, there is a case scenario, a 35 years old male presented to the hospital with a case of renal cell carcinoma. Imaging studies revealed a large tumor in the right kidney extending into the inferior vena cava. Given the aggressive nature of the tumor and risk of metastasis, the decision was made to proceed with a nephrectomy to remove the affected kidney and tumor. Uh, Dr. Nadeem is uh, like smiling. He knows that almost this is the same scenario we face like uh, uh, in like every uh, one or two months time in a theater. And uh, during the surgical procedure, the urologist encounters a sudden massive hemorrhage uh, due to an unexpected vascular injury. And this, despite attempts to control the bleeding, which the urologist tried to do uh, initially, and then the, they call some vascular surgeons and the patient's blood pressure drop uh, to 50 by 20 and his heart rate to 130. And um, like the poor anesthetist has tried to uh, manage the patient with the vasopressors. The patient has already received eight units of packed blood blood cells and four liters of uh, crystalloids. So uh, what do you think that, what should be the next step of management, keeping this in a scenario? <laughs> I think so the, uh, with this uh, like a scenario the vascular surgeon will already be in the theater most probably and uh, like what should be the next step of management I think so that uh, to summarize this that we have to ask the surgeon to stop the surgery first that they should start stop the surgery because the patient is now getting out of hand like it's like on a high vasopressor support we have already given the eight units of pack cells four liter of crystalloid so a lot of things going on and patient can, might get into a multi-organ failure if we will be continuing the surgery we will be continuing the trauma of the surgery uh, we can start thinking about the damage control resuscitation. I think so that the time was that the patient received only eight units of Paxil. So the one thing was missing was like initially the patient has now reached to a stage that I, I think so that things might be not reversible. So that initially to start, I will talk about a little bit of a damage control resuscitation, what's going on, what is the point of care resuscitation, what are the drugs we can give interoperatively that can help to reduce this massive transfusion and the, uh, the complication of the massive transfusion. Uh, so anybody with a definition of massive blood transfusion, what we call as a massive blood transfusion. In how many pack cells we transfuse that we call it as a ma massive blood transfusion? In how much time? So interestingly, uh, when uh, I have already given a talk like about one year back and I tried to search that what is a massive blood transfusion definition. So there are like, these are the all definitions which come up with that. There is no single definition explaining the massive blood transfusion that one says that greater than five pack cells in four hours, other says the 50% blood volume in three hours, and the other says that greater than three pack cells unit during any one hour period in the first 24 hours of the admission to the hospital. Traditionally, traditionally, we follow this, the 10 units of whole blood transfusion within 24 hours. But the problem with this is like, we do, cannot wait for 24 hours to label this as a patient of a massive transfusion. So that that is the reason that these all other definitions came in. Said so for the research purpose, but the people mostly use this greater than 10 units or placement of whole blood volume within 24 hours as a standard definition for the massive transfusion. So uh, do you uh, do we think that this patient have a massive transfusion? So definitely like in our scenario, the patient have already received like eight units of packed red blood cell. So most probably the patient is in a massive transfusion. 
so uh, is there any protocol in the hospital uh, of like massive transfusion protocol activation uh, anybody have an idea like how they activate their massive transfusion protocols i know from my hospital that like in my hospital there was a case of a, a hepatectomy that was shifted in an icu and then were damage control resuscitated uh, surgery and then the patient was planned to re-explore the next morning i called to the blood bank in my fellowship in I icu that uh, we need to activate the massive transfusion protocol and then the guy said okay i have activated and i asked my anesthetist senior that i have already activated the massive transfusion. you can take the patient to the theater once the patient was in theater they asked for the blood there was no blood available so they said that to, to whom you have informed about the uh, activation of the massive transfusion protocol then after that our hospital sat down and we uh, developed a like an online system to get the activation of massive transfusion protocol so that that is the important part that if in a theater we encounter a patient with an active bleeding so we need to see that how we can activate the massive transfusion protocol so that there should be an online system there should be some on call system to whom we have informed it should be written as well people use different triggers for activation of massive transfusion protocol the first one is like a assessment of blood consumption score that is usually for the trauma patients and this is uh, the second part is like critical administration threat to threshold that are three units of packed rbc if we order for somebody if within one hour then it should be the alert on the blood bank system that is the massive transfusion protocol the other thing that people use usually that is also in trauma that is a shock index that is heart rate divided by systolic blood pressure if greater than one then the right away from an er the massive transfusion protocol can be activated so uh, in a couple of next slide we will be talking about what is the damage control uh, resuscitation so actually the damage damage control resuscitation is to prevent the patient from going into this lethal triad not it's like the once the lethal triad is set in and then we are doing the damage control resuscitation so uh, this triad is called as a lethal triad or a death triad for us uh, like the patient if the patient is having a, a massive uh, bleeding either due to trauma or due to in the surgery these are the three component factors which are the important like hypothermia acidosis and coagulopathy and these are all functioning like a, a, a like as a catalyst for one another so you if you are will be target and interestingly if you see this triad there is nothing written on the hypotension here so important is that we are targeting the blood pressure not this hypothermia acidosis and coagulopathy so these are the things we need to uh, monitor so these are the fundamental parts of this uh, like damage control resuscitation which which we need to see uh, number one is rapid diagnosis uh, the surgeon need to be uh, like communicating to the anesthetist or the all the other staff at the theater that we have a hair, hair case of uncontrolled bleeding so we need to be on our toes and we activate massive transfusion protocol and other things uh, limit the crystalloid don't give excessive fluids if you suspect that patient is having like now the uh, uncontrollable bleeding or massive transfusion protocol activated so limit the crystal or don't give more of a saline if you give a saline what is the ph of saline it's like around 5.5 the ph of ringer lactate is itself is 6.5 so these both if you give more of a crystal it will be causing more of a acidosis more of a dilution of coagulation factor so uh, consumptive coagulopathy is already there and we are uh, causing more of that dilution of the coagulation factors uh, permissive hypotension one question that what what are the ideal blood pressure we should be maintaining during this damage control resuscitation so most of the literature speaks about like it's the 90 of a systolic blood pressure but not for a traumatic brain injury patient if we have a traumatic brain injury patient with some vascular injury and we're doing in a theater then we need to keep our systolic blood pressure uh, should be above the 100 uh, that is the guideline and then there is like one is to one is to one uh, ratio of transfusion which we all like to hear like to ask about the uh, from the residents in the exam and on the bedside as well uh, people have given uh, this all data come from like uh, american soldiers in uh, fighting in iraq people have done after that uh, these iraq fighting as well like in the civilian trauma as well so they found that this strategy is like one of the most promising in uh, like preventing the mortality and morbidity of the patient with a like a massive hemorrhage and uh, uh, requiring a lot of uh, blood products the other thing was like uh, 
if we give the uh, pack blood, uh, red blood cells, platelets, and plasma like FFPs, where the cryoprecipitate stands. So there was a, like one recent trial recently from an NHS that is cryostat trial that they were giving a early high empirical cryoprecipitate as well just to see that either they prevent the mortality or morbidity. So there was no significant difference. So they must be like we will be using the fibrinogen levels to guide to give the cryoprecipitates. Uh, interoperative indications for damage control, I think so that uh, you know better than me what are the indications if we are unable to control the bleeding from a venous side, if patient is becoming hemodynamically unstable, we are requiring a lot of products, then we need to, uh, uh, these are the indications of damage control that we should stop the surgery, secure the hemostasis, hemostasis pack the uh, patient, shift to ICU, maintain the normal physiology, try to keep, uh, like to uh, reverse the pathology and maintain the physiology, as well, then come again back for the surgery. Uh, other is like, we see in a damage control resuscitation that is one is to one is to one. The other is like point of care resuscitation, thromboostography and rotum. Anybody uh, have an eye like uh, uh, comment on that? What like either the one is to one is one is superior or it is like the rotum or the thromboelastography. Rotum is better, like Dr. Zia is saying. Anybody on the favor of the tag or rotum? Dr. Nadim. So like. Uh, it didn't show any difference. Like if the people do like it's one is to one is to one, it's like the rapid diagnosis and the management uh, that we need. Uh, we should not give an excessive crystallite. We are straight away on the blood products that one is to one is to one we are giving and we are not using Rotem. Uh, although the studies have shown that Rotem and Tag have limited the use of the blood products, but the difference in the morbidity and mortality is not uh, very much significant. These are two recent papers which I have shared. Uh, role of transamine. Anybody? So it's it's like a drug which every vascular surgeon, cardiac surgeon want to give to the patient <laughs> after the, and now in like total knee replacements, orthopedic surgeon. So there was a large trial crash too in 2013, which says that if we give this, uh, like the drug, which is an anti-fibrinolytic drug, which we give like within three hours of this uh, setting of the cascade that it helps the provide the morbidity and mortality. But the interesting is like, now there is a crash three trial came in that also help says that it also helps in the traumatic brain injury patient to prevent from the like the expansion of the uh, hematoma. So uh, transamine is there. Uh, any other drug we know of that we can give in the theater for like massive hemorrhage? Factor seven. So, like mostly, the factor seven is not approved for like a massive hemorrhage control, but like people use it like without uh, they on their own experience. So, usually the factor seven was like the like the congenital coagulation factor deficiencies for that purpose, but not for like intraoperative hemorrhage. But people have using it, and there are like individual, but not recommendation for my, any like a society to give like a factor seven. But if you want to give factor seven, give it an early. Don't delay it. If the patient is sets in that lethal trader, that it will be difficult to go get out from that. The other thing interesting was while I make this presentation that why we are not giving the whole blood. Is there uh, like uh, any promising result with the whole blood? So in fact, the uh, one of the uh, like bulletin from the Medical College of Surgeon was that the uh, the most downloaded article from the Journal of American College of Surgeon in 2020 was uh, 22 was impact of incorporating whole blood into hemorrhagic shock resuscitation. So uh, the people have seen that if we use the uh, whole blood that have an impact like decreases the mortality as compared to the inter blood component therapy. Uh, but still like uh, people are working on that, that whole blood. Uh, we have a data from like, I think so civil hospital about two, three years back. They were saying that they usually give this whole blood transfusion to the trauma patients with the massive hemorrhage and they have a promising result as compared to our patient population. So. Uh, still, uh, cell saver, uh, no, mostly available in the hospitals, but uh, due to the cost issues, due to the uh, uh, like the availability of perfusionist, uh, we usually don't use. But like I just marked that in this patient, the tumor was involved in the major vessel, so that patient, uh, that patient need to be discussed with the surgeon, with the family that we will be needing a cell saver intraoperatively if we uh, uh, want that the patient, uh, if we are expecting a higher blood loss, uh, like. 
it is written like it uh, if we use we don't need to open all the kit of the cell saver if we usually use only it in a standby mode so it costs around like about the two units of that pack cells but this is from the western data i don't know from the pakistani economic point of view that what it will be the costing of the blood bag or for this so uh from the association of anesthetist guidelines cell saver for 2018 that it should be recommended when it is expected to reduce the likelihood uh, likelihood of allergenic blood transfusion or severe post operative anemia uh interestingly these are the resuscitation targets which we are like uh, targeting in the theater once we receive like we are having a massive hemorrhage protocol patient uh this is the, the first is showing by the canadian ontario they usually recommend that the uh, the hemoglobin should be 80 but european guidelines are like 70 to 90 uh, 7 to 9 hemoglobin or uh, our anesthesia society says that greater than 8 is more than enough inr should be like uh, less than 1.5 but in intero it's like 1.8 Uh, for the fibrinogen it's very important that if we give, want to give a transamine the uh, the fibrinogen level should be above 150 because it's an anti fibrinolytic drug if the fibrinogen levels are low then the transamine will not be working so this is this is this is the important thing that we need to uh, get the blood levels of fibrinogen level just to make an idea then we can give a transamine if we are giving blindly transamine it will not be going to help us uh platelets should be greater than 50 if the patient is actively bleeding these are the calcium uh couple of two three uh, two slides of the complications i uh, don't think that will be much more better there are like a uh, transfusion complication that were the blood transfusion complication mostly are hemolytic non hemolytic uh we usually encounter in an icu like this patient should be more like be going to the icu so the complication which we usually face is like the metabolic derangements most commonly the hypocalcemia hypermagnesemia hyperkalemia and these are the things that we uh, encounter in an icu we need to correct that identify that that uh, these are the complications that these are the severe metabolic complication which keep your hand transfusion related acute lung injury or transfusion related acute circulatory overload these usually happen with the like whole bloods not with the individual blood component uh, uh, therapy so uh, in summary it's a damage control resuscitation is more than a single technique or treatment but rather many things that combine resuscitation and surgical care uh, damage control resuscitation when employed lead to improve survival decrease length of stay and improve outcomes uh, damage control resuscitation and point of care resuscitation outcome still some people think that rotum tag is much better than the one is to one therapy but uh, still debate going on uh, whole blood administration again gaining popularity the problem is with that whole blood cannot be stored like for more than 30 35 days so that is one of the problem the other thing is that you cannot get that o negative bloods with low titers of antibodies to be stored in your blood bank so that is the biggest problem with this whole blood so mostly uh, trauma uh, surgeons like uh, uh, hope so like our uh, here uh, the uh, the army center like afic might be having that like the old uh, o blood with low antibody titer for a massive hemorrhage because they are in a combat situation but uh, like with the civilian trauma it's difficult to keep these uh, thing any idea that uh, either we should use a, a old blood or a new blood <laughs> so we usually give that so there are like a couple of trials of that as well either we use a choose a old blood or a new blood so there is no difference between old and new blood we usually think that as the blood get older the oxygen carrying capacity decreases all the other complication of stored blood so there is a large trial last trial is able trial in 2016 or 17 i think so they showed that old or new there is nothing difference in the outcome of the mortality but still i know that these trials don't uh, see all the other confounding factors but still the new blood is a better without any stored lesions but like if we see in all the blood banks is the first come first out so we always get the old blood okay <laughs> thank you so much thank you dr shaib uh, that was an excellent presentation and i think for the for the vascular surgeon especially for the young vascular surgeon sitting here if i can summarize it from a surgical point of view i would say that if there is massive bleeding control the bleeding stop surgery as you said breathe for the surgeons breathe and let the anesthetist control the blood pressure and heart rate of the patient and the anesthetist <laughs> and they both have to go in opposite direction <laughs> okay yes and for the activation of massive transfusion protocol as surgeons you will you will know about it before the anesthetist yes. so tell them beforehand rather than the anesthetist finding out and shouting yes. at you any questions <laughs> Yeah.
yeah yeah thank you sir for such an informative presentation uh my question you said we should we need to check the fibrinogen levels before we actually give trazamine so how quickly we can get the fibrinogen level we have to decide then and there yeah there are like uh, a couple of uh, invest like now monitors available yet that that will give you on a on a, in an a theater like heme q and everything they will give you at the at at the very moment like 3 to 5 minutes in time but like in rotec and rotam it takes like 30 minutes but like we have the now couple of uh, gadgets that will give you a report in 15 minutes as well but still like if you are saying that we don't know about the fibrinogen level i am just i am not against using the trazamine if 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 like ld trauma coagulopathy have started due to the surgery we should give it but like you we have to send the fibrinogen levels it's not like if we have given a trazamine started the infusion and we forget about the fibrinogen level we need to monitor that it should be above 50 then we will be getting getting a benefit from trazamine it's not like that we will be not giving it we will be giving it straight away like if you say that like, there is a bleeding we will start giving the trazamine but we need to get the levels but like in our hospital if we give if we give a stat slip it's like around 1 hour they will give it give you a call that these are the levels so It, yeah, it's right. all, this all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's move to the next presentation. Uh, Dr. Fakhar Hawa. Dr. Fakhar has a comment. <laughs> so it's a small comment regarding you know the using the old blood. Be careful, you know, uh, in patients who are having renal failure yeah. and having hyperkalemia, it may be deadly. Yes. So so you know it's not that. Oh, every old is the gold so <laughs> it's it's actually yeah. the uh, it's actually the blood bank policy uh, yes. when i come across that yeah. it's yeah. like the, it's yeah. all across across the globe that first in first out like yeah. they will be giving you but if you need a like uh, fresh blood that you need to ask them just like in our hospital the cabbage patient usually get that new blood they usually request it and then they will get it yeah but yeah. be careful yeah yeah yeah, yeah 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 okay uh, uh, let's move on i think we've got uh, we're running short of time Uh, next i would quickly want to invite dr saf assalamualaikum so after the much heated uh, discussion about the intraoperative phase now i will be discussing about the post operative uh, time period and my talk will be around the post operative pain and the fluid management in the vascular surgery patients so um, this nothing to disclose uh, no di conflict of interest we begin with a case scenario um, we have a 55 years old female she, um, who is admitted to the intensive care unit following a midline laparotomy for the infrarenal abdominal aortic aneurysm surgery on admission to icu her vital signs are as follows the blood pressures are 95 by 60 heart rate of 105 beats per minute and she is receiving the norepinephrine infusion at 0.06 mics per kg per minute to support her blood pressures additionally uh, for her pain management she has an epidural catheter in place for the post operative pain management but um, the patient is experiencing severe pain she is restless grimacing and unable to find a comfortable position how will you manage this patient now in terms of the post operative pain so um from this scenario we have certain keywords in this scenario like um she had undergone a midline laparotomy with a large incision but her blood pressures were 95 by 60 she is on norepinephrine infusion she has an epidural catheter in place for the pain management but despite having an epidural catheter in place she is experiencing severe pain so the goals of uh, my talk is to know about the assessment of the pain and how can we optimize the epidural analgesia what is the concept of the multimodal approach monitoring of the patient reassess our treatment interventions and adjust accordingly so for the pain assessment we all know we have different scores like uh, verbal rating scale numerical rating scales and we need to assess the intensity and the nature of the pain using the standardized scales but for the patient who are admitted in the icu we don't use these scales we have different scales for the icu patients and there are different scales behavioral pain scales and the recently we can we are using the critical pain observation tool so it has different indicators like facial expressions body movement muscle tension and depending upon the patient is 
intubated or not intubated. So our patient was extubated. So uh, all these parameters have different scorings. If we calculate our patient's score, it was around seven score. And in the critical pain observation tool, any score more than two needs to be treated. It's unacceptable, unbearable pain. So our patient had um, a pain score of seven. So what we can do, since we have an epidural catheter, we need to first review or optimize the epidural analgesia ke options. Kya hai. So consider uh, adjusting the epidural infusion rate or the concentration of the epidural just my drug. Hai. If the epidural is not providing the adequate pain relief, as we can see in this patient, consider using supplemental analgesics or the alternative pain management options. In our patient, the heart rate was 105 and the blood pressure was 95 by 60 already. And the patient was on norepinephrine. So initiating or increasing the dose of uh, epidural infusion would really would result in further vasodilation and further deterioration of this condition. So for our patient, the epidural option is out. So what we need to do, we have to use a multimodal approach in which we utilize uh, different pain management um, modalities, non-interventional pharmacological interventions such as distraction or relaxation techniques. If we talk about medications, we have the options of opioids, but in Pakistan, you know, ke, um, opioid key availability is a major issue. And secondly, the side effects associated with the increasing doses of opioid would also be an issue. So we need to complement them with NSAIDs, acetaminophen, and you can add adjuvants like pregabalin before the surgery. Start preemptively the, with the pregabalin in such patients in which you are in anticipating a big incision. Here I would like to um, talk about the different option of uh, ketamine. You can start in such patients a low dose ketamine because um, as I said, we have a limited supply of opioids. So ketamine could be a good option for such patient. And we started in a lower dose of 0.1 mg per kg. Every four hour we can give this uh, to the patient. And also if the pain is not settling, you can start an infusion at 0.1 mg per kg per hour confusion. But you have to be careful. Um, it's not recommended in the patient who have psychosis or the liver dysfunction. Other option that we can use is a very good option is a dexmedetomidine infusion. It's an alpha-2 agonist and we can use it at the dose of, point, uh, we have to load it with the one microgram per kg IV over 10 minutes. And the maintenance, uh, you can start the infusion at 0.2 to, to one mics per kg per hour. This will give you analgesia and sedation as well. But be careful. Uh, uh, about using dexmedetomidine in patients with ischemic heart disease. Other techniques that we can use is the regional anesthesia techniques, transverse abdominal spin block, rectus sheet block, and different variations of the quadratus lumborum block. Um, this is something that the vascular surgeons can also do while closing uh, the patient. You just need to infiltrate Besides the local job infiltrate before closing the rectus sheet, you can infiltrate in the facial plane. If you can infiltrate like 20 ml of the bupivacaine or any local anesthetic, this would give you a very good pain relief for the next 24 hours. And this would decrease uh, the need of other uh, analgesics. So always consider patients comorbidities, allergies and possible drug in interactions when selecting these medications. So uh, we need to continuously monitor the vital signs, including the blood pressure, heart rate, and assess the impact of the pain management interventions and monitor for the potential side effects of our intervention and reassess according to the pain level and modify if required. So coming to the um, second scenario, it is now the second post-operative day and her vital signs are stable with the blood pressures now being 115 by 65 and heart rate of 95. The patient is awake with adequate urine output 
and no signs of ongoing hemorrhage or hemodynamic instability. Your resident approaches to you with a question about the duration of the fluid resuscitation. So there's a concept of the four Ds of the fluid management. We consider fluids also as the drugs. So the fluids all are the drugs which have a certain indications, contraindications and side effects. The major indications for the fluids are resuscitation, maintenance and the replacement. And the timing and the administration rate of the fluids is equally important and in contrast but in contrast to most of the drugs the fluids he there's no specific standard dose so we need to know the duration of the fluid therapy is crucial and the volume must be tapered when the shock is resolved and while the starting triggers for the fluid are clear um, we have the clinicians are less aware of the stopping triggers about the fluid resuscitation and then there comes the stage of the de-escalation. It is the final step in the fluid therapy to withhold or withdraw the fluids when they are no longer required. And this would reduce the risk of the fluid overlaid and the related deleterious effects. So for de-escalation, the traditional approach that we give um, fluids to overcome the anesthesia induced by uh, vasodilation is the wet approach. The fluid results, uh, fluid overload results in edema and organ dysfunction and the de-escalation was first suggested in 2012 and then finally coined in 2014. It is specifically refers to the late goal directed fluid removal which involves the aggressive and active fluid removal through diuretics and renal replacement therapy if available. So the five steps of de-escalation de is define a clinical clear clinical endpoint, for example, improvement in oxygenation, set the fluid balance goal, set a perfusion and renal safety precautions like vasopressors ki need hai nahi hai and if the serum, if you are decreasing the fluids, whether the serum tract, you need to observe the serum tract in level. De-evaluate after every 24 hours unless the safety limits is reached and adjust and plan accordingly. So in summary, these are the take home messages. Assist the pain and tailor the plan for the individual patient. Use the multimodal approach. Reassess and readjust. And fluid should be prescribed with the same care as any other drug and avoid their unnecessary administration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Asaf. Um, I think this is extremely important for all the surgeons to be aware of pain management and fluid resuscitation and fluid requirements of the patient as well. Uh, any questions, please? I think you've clarified you. it very well. Thank you very much. <laughs> for the last talk, I would invite Dr. Fakhar Fayaz. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the scientific committee and uh, especially Professor S. Manzoor Bhatti for inviting me here, you know, to, to uh, you know, deliver a talk about the thrico abdominal aortic aneurysm repair, uh, the key anesthesia aspects. Uh, actually, uh, the topic is very complex and the thrico abdominal aortic aneurysm is not only, you know, a gigantic task for the surgeon, but it's a, it's very challenging for the anesthetist as well. Um, so, uh, starting from the, you know, meticulous pre-op planning and then, you know, the multitasking during the intraoperative period and uh, very tiring but fulfilling postoperative care. Uh, this type of you know surgery is quite challenge for for the anesthetist. So before I go further, you know I would like to have few uh, key concepts, you know few key facts. The incidence that this uh, you know uh, thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm is around 5.9 to 16 percent per hundred thousand population. It's 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 a bit less you know as compared to the abdominal, which is around 350 uh, per hundred thousand population. Uh, most of the patients, they are above 70 years of age. The male predominance is there around 70%. If we keep it untreated, the five-year survival rate is very less. Four out of five will die uh, in five years. If surgery correction is done, then, you know, the five-year five survival rate is around 60%. 
so at least you know we can save another three out of five. Uh, but at the cost of five to 12 percent mortality rate, uh, and the major complications are renal failure and the neurological deficit postoperatively. So as far as the you know uh, this type of disease is concerned, there are a lot many comorbid conditions which are associated with it. The, you know, 70 percent they are hypertensive, and around 30 percent they have got the coronary artery disease uh, associated with it. With it, and then diabetic, and you know, as I've already mentioned, this is the old age, and the, any form of use of the you know uh, tobacco. And then the pulmonary disease is around association is around 30 percent, and the COPD is you know they they have got three uh, times more risk of having you know rupture of these aneurysms, and the renal function is associated is around 15 percent of the patients. The predisposing factors which are associated with the aneurysmal rupture, they are, you know, you, we all know that the aneurysm diameter is more than five centimeter, hypertensives, they are more at risk, smokers. Then I've already mentioned about the COPD, all those who are having continuous pain, uh, the chronic cardiac dissection and the old age, they are all at risk of early rupture of the aneurysms. So these are the three classifications, you know, which uh, the anesthetist must know uh, before dealing, you know, and we all know about them. Uh, mainly there are two classifications uh, regarding, you know, uh, dissections. They are Debecky and the Stanford. The Debecky is mainly, you know, uh, with the uh, uh, in location of the intimal tear. It's based on in, uh, location of the intimal tear, whereas the Stanford only you know says that if the ascending aorta is involved is type A, if the ascending aorta is not involved is type B. So the urgency is is declared on on that basis. And the Crawford is basically uh, was devised in 1984, and it's uh, you know for the descending thoracic uh, uh, aortic aneurysms. So I have divided my you know management part in three parts: preoperative management, intraoperative management, the postoperative management. So we recommend you know the multidisciplinary team approach. So involve all uh, the medical personnel uh, in uh, who are involved in the in the patient care, especially the surgeon, anesthetist, uh, the perfusionist, and the primary physician. So gather all the information. We cannot stress more on you know the history and the examination and and the relevant investigation, especially the CT autogram. We, you know, when we are planning for such type of surgery, we, we sit together, we see the CT autogram, we see the extent, and then we plan for the, you know, surgical management as well as the anesthetic management. So make out the best surgical anesthetic plan and then discuss and make out the visceral protection plan, especially brain, spinal cord, and the other vital organs. Then we make a bailout plan in case our plan A fails. So brief the whole surgical team and then reach one consensus. So regarding the pre-op optimization, uh, um, uh, as we have already known, you know that uh, around 30% of the patients they have got the uh, you know pulmonary diseases. So so we need to stop the smoking, and then you know the arterial blood gases, and then there are other relevant tests we uh, do for the pre-op optimization. And here we do involve the pulmonologist. Uh, apart from the you know cardiologist for the cardiac assessment, uh, this again a risk assessment you know thing, and the other thing is that we we need pre-op optimization as well. So for the cardiac status, you know as we know there there is thirty percent association of the uh, ischemic heart disease and around. Um, Seventy percent they are hypertensive, so we continue the antihypertensive drugs, and you know if required we go for the angiography, uh, and uh, if intervention is required then we go for that as well. So renal functions we maintain the hydration, uh, then you know optimization of the hemostasis. Doctor Swabe has made my life very easy. He has already you know explained about the coagulopathies and their management. Uh, so we know you know uh, these type of patients they are coagulopathic, and uh, we need to plan. Uh, the uh, it before you know uh, how to manage the coagulopathy and the bleeding part. So intraoperatively, uh, the anesthetist has to do the multitasking, and that all uh, revolves uh, regarding you know around the protection of the major you know organs. To, uh, so their safety is the main thing, which is you know it, uh, our consideration. So uh, maintain the hemodynamics. Um, ensure wide board IV line, central venous line, rapid infuser sets. You know this Belmont device is, is you know is essential. 
so both radial and femoral artery pressure monitoring you know we do uh, i usually pass you know three arterial lines uh, on both the radials and you know uh, one on the femoral side uh, especially for the aortic surgery so prepare both vasodilator and vasopressors uh, whatever is available with you we can go for that we usually keep the norepinephrine phenylephrine and in uh, the gtn then you know uh, transesophageal echocardiography transesophageal echocardiography is very very important tool uh, during the aortic surgery one you know we were talking about the ischemia so it detects ischemia even before ecg does it two fluid resuscitation during during the surgery you know we want to know the uh, contractility of the heart we want to know the preload of the heart that we can you know very well uh, judge on transesophageal echocardiography and then you know we can assist the surgeon while he is passing all the cannulas for the bypass we can we can tell him the position of his cannulas if whether they are at the appropriate site especially when we are uh, having the <coughs> femoral femoral bypass and the ivc cannula is placed under transesophageal echo and then the distal perfusion techniques so i will be talking in detail about the distal perfusion techniques left heart bypass local bypass partial femoral femoral bypass and the complete cardiopulmonary bypass with selective indicated cerebral perfusion or deep hypothalamic circulatory arrest when you know the arch of aorta is involved so a uh, few things about the left heart bypass most commonly used in crawford type 1 2 and sometimes in type 3 as well so we use it while you know doing our thrack abdominal aortic aneurysm surgeries this left heart bypass is is simple it's not a uh, complicated thing uh, we take out the oxygenated blood from the left atrium through either left atrial appendage or the left spear pulmonary vein and we pass a you know cannula in that and then the distal perfusion is maintained uh, through the femoral artery um uh, it we require a centrifugal pump and and we can maintain the flow uh it has got two advantages actually the primary advantage is to uh, perfuse the distal part of the uh, body and the other thing is to reduce the hypertension which uh, occurs on the proximal part of the heart when we apply the uh, cross clamp so the other thing is uh that the local loop which we usually do for the uh coarctation of the aorta so we, we can uh, you know uh, the surgeon actually does it uh, so what he does is that he he can pass two uh, aortic cannulas joined by a tubing uh, one proximal to the one proximal uh, cross clamp and the other distal to the distal cross clamp uh, the downside is that we don't have any control on it so the flow depends upon the size of the graft and and you know the contractility and the preload uh, of the heart so then the partial femoral femoral bypass is again you know same thing which is left uh, left heart bypass the only thing is that we are taking out the deoxygenated blood from the femoral vein and then we are using the you know the oxygenator and the reservoir and then pumping it to into the femoral artery and again the main purpose is to oh, basically perfuse the distal parts so one lung ventilation is must uh, and and we all know about you know it's achieved through the double lumen tube uh, and there are a few other uh, you know things i will not be discussing in details but it, one lung ventilation is is a requirement then the most important thing is the spinal cord protection so we do the permissive hypothermia we uh, can use the csf drainage will i be be talking you know separately then the reimplantation of the intercostal and this segmental arteries and then the sequential clamping technique so the surgeon they are because i know you know most of the uh, the people here are, are vascular surgeons they know the sequential clamping technique i will not be discussing it in detail and then you know the monitoring you know whether our uh, distal perfusion is working or not and this uh, calculate the ischemic time we do the monitoring as well few words about the csf drainage 80% reduction in the risk of paraplegia in you know thoracic abdominal aortic uh, aneurysm surgery uh, by just doing the, this this technique so spinal cord perfusion pressure we all know it's mean arterial pressure minus the csf pressure so either we have to increase the mean arterial pressure we have to reduce the csf pressure uh, to achieve our target of 70 mm of mercury so the target csf pressure which we usually want to keep is our, you know our wish to keep it around 10 to 15 mm of mercury but whenever it goes above we can drain some csf out of it and we can achieve it uh, but the target you know if 
the pressure is higher and we are taking out a lot of CSF, then you know we have the limit of the 20 ml per hour. If we are going more than 20 ml per hour, then we stop, you know, and then we have the only one option that we increase the mean arterial pressure. So as far as the renal protection is concerned, hypothermia, distal aortic perfusion, as I've already discussed, and then the cold crystalloid perfusion in the renal artery, we can protect the renal arteries as uh, the kidneys as well. So bleeding and coagulopathy, the use of cell saver. We uh, we do uh, use cell saver in every case, and uh, just to reduce the you know allogenic transfusion. The again the rapid infuser, keep ample number of uh, red cell concentrate on hand according to your institutional protocol. And then, you know, uh, we anticipate the coagulopathy and we start the transnexamic case infusion uh, from the very beginning in, in these type of cases. Uh, Dr. Saheb has already discussed in detail and I will not be going in further detail. So the, as far as the post diabetic management is concerned, again, the hemodynamics, as we know, the ischemic heart disease, the patient may require inotropes. So uh, we want to control the blood pressure. We want to increase the spinal cord perfusion pressure. So we manipulate with the inotropic support. And then, you know, uh, we get it for the myocardial dysfunction as well. post diabetic pain, you know, uh, it's a lot of stress. Not only if you want to make your patient comfortable, but if your patient is having a scar from the chest to the abdomen, he will not be able to breathe. So, so for that matter, we use the you know epidural catheter which we put in uh, before induction or after induction, you know, uh, in in the latter position. So the pulmonary complications they do happen, you know for the after one lung or fluid resuscitation or due to the you know uh, weak heart, the patient may go into pulmonary edema, there may be airway edema, and then there are few complications which are associated with the massive transfusion, like transfusion related acute lung injury or the ARDS, etc. So we, we do manage them in the post-operative period. So as for the renal, again, you know, we uh, meticulously monitor the renal functions in the post-operative period. And if required, we go for the, you know, renal replacement therapy early in the form of CVVH. Uh, again, neurological dysfunction can happen in the post-operative period as well. Uh, and the management is is same, you know, um, to maintain this spinal cord perfusion pressure uh, and uh, above 70 millimeter mercury. Coagulopathy, that can happen in the post-operative period as well, bleeding. So, so we, we do manage it, you know, we keep the uh, platelet count, the, the you know, uh, coagulation pr uh, profile, you know, in the normal limits. So then there is the entity which is called delayed spinal cord deficit after thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm repair, uh, which uh, can happen after 72 hours. And there is a you know detailed uh, protocol, uh, so Caselli Baylor uh, protocol, you know algorithm, in which we see you know uh, we confirm that the mean arterial pressure is more than 90 or 100. Uh, if the CSF drain is in place. Okay, if not, then we try to put in as soon as possible. And then we give dexamethasone and the mannitol. And after giving that, we try to you know, keep the CSF pressure. Again, they're the same parameters between 10 to 15. Uh, same, you know, spinal cord between 70 millimeter mercury. And then in you know, the target map, 110 and 115 and CVP of 12. And we want to keep the hemoglobin above 10 here. So if we achieve our target of uh, recovery from the neurological deficit, it's okay. Then we continue with the CSF drainage for next 48 hours. If not, then we consider the lidocaine or the magnesium sulfate in addition to the management, which have, I have already mentioned. So at the end, I will conclude that the key to success is the multidisciplinary team involvement at planning stage. It's not it's on the same day. I'm, so, so this should not happen. Uh, so meticulous planning and its execution and then aiming at the prevention of the complications is the bottom line. So I thank you very much. Any any questions? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fakhar. Um, aorta was the flavor of the day and I think it's good to have a last presentation from the head end of the patient. Uh, any questions? I think we're quite short of time, so a couple of questions and then we'll have concluding remarks. Do you uh, put a spinal drain in all the patients and how do you select the patients to put the spinal drain in? Sorry? 
The spinal drain. Spinal drain. Do you put in all the patients or how do you select the patients to put Actually, the drain the, into? In the Crawford type 1 and 2, we do 800%. And uh, in 3, you know, uh, the surgeon decides that the, uh, he requires spinal cord uh, protection as well. So then we go for it, uh, for the CSF drain. But in Crawford type 1 and Crawford type 2, we go for the CSF drain 100%. If there are no more questions, can we have the concluding remarks? Uh, thank, sir. thank you very much. Similar so, asking. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, our anesthetist colleague. But there is one question which is in my mind, not to you. Uh, who is responsible for post-operative analgesia? Um, control is the pain management, acute pain management team, yeah, anesthetist, or is a surgeon. So, this question, inshallah, we will ask you at the tea if it is there. So, alhamdulillah, all these uh, presentations were excellent, and uh, we were educated by our anesthetist colleague. And what are our limitations? We now know very well, and uh, Probably, if we are prepared, they will not postpone the case unnecessarily as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll, I'll ask Dr. Khalil to start the next session, please. Uh, we have two distinguished uh, guests, uh, Dr. Sohail Choksi and Dr. Khalid Mukhdumi may be leaving. So big clap uh, of thanks for him because they have been very much part of that. So yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. I, I want to say something. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, our uh, uh, guests from abroad, uh, for your ever willing um, contribution to the country, back to the country and to your colleague around here. Uh, one thing which I just wanted to convey to you before you leave this place, that uh, keep in touch. We are very lousy and uh, very slow in uh, keeping some connection with the with the uh, our uh, colleagues in. Uh, abroad, but you are, remain, alhamdulillah, very active and so particularly I'm very thankful to Khalid Makhdoumi. He remained always helpful to the, to our uh, society in the formation, from the formation of the society and for, particularly for this conference as well. So uh, we will make few requests to you uh, for the training of our, uh, uh, our trainees, our, particularly our fellows who needs your help, uh, particularly in the in endovascular. And so, since this morning, we have been requesting that we have deficient um, departments in our in, in this country, and we, our uh, trainees do need uh, your help. And please uh, create some place for these uh, boys and girls if they turn up to UK or uh, in uh, Middle East for their further training in endovascular. Thank you very much. And a big uh, clap for uh, all of them. Uh, these professors, even online, they helped us last, and they, alhamdulillah, uh, contributed. It is your sadqa uh, jariya, we say in, uh, in, in Islamic terminology, and uh, it, it will pay you after, inshallah, here and here afterward. And thank you very much. And, uh, yeah. 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 Please. Before they leave. Thank you very much. This should be in the concluding session, but uh, uh, we are already lagging behind one hour and the concluding session, inshallah, will be very short because they are leaving. Thank you.
हम तो नहीं कटेंगे Thank you. 